Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on The Battle for Rome. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to witness the final battle in the Roman Civil Wars. First between Antony and Octavian in the Roman Senate, and then between Antony and Octavian themselves. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. We'll start by setting the scene, figuring out how we got to this point in time, and then we're going to take a look at the bloody mess that's erupted after the assassination of Caesar. From there, we're going to look at the revenge tour of the Second Triumvirate. And finally, we'll wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we got to this point in time. Well, it all begins long before Rome ever existed in the early Iron Age, and during that time, the Italian peninsula was full of a diversity of tribes, the strongest and wealthiest and most complex and most powerful of which were, of course, the Etruscans. Rome itself was, it was founded in 753 BC by Romulus, and over the next 250 years, Rome was ruled by a series of seven kings. But we all know that absolute power corrupts absolutely, and so while those first kings started out pretty good, the last one, Tarquin the Proud, was not a very good dude. And so what we see is in 509 BC, Lucius Junius Brutus leads a rebellion against that king, kicking him out of the city of Rome and instituting the Roman Republic. Now, the guiding ideology of the Republic is there are no more kings in Rome. No single person shall rule. Instead, even at the highest levels of government, there are always at least two people ruling, the two consuls. And those consuls themselves are elected by the people. What we see is over the first few hundred years of the Republic, it's expanding first across the Italian peninsula and then into the broader Roman world. But after kind of conquering most of the Mediterranean, we see the kind of evolution of these very, very powerful military leaders who start using Roman armies not to fight foreign enemies, but to fight each other. That's first exemplified with the Populares leader, Gaius Marius, and his kind of counterpart and enemy, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. So Sulla represents the senatorial optimate cause, Marius represents the kind of people in the Populares cause, and together, they are the first people to start using their Roman armies to march on the city of Rome. Now, there's no real decisive victor there. And so years later, right, a couple decades later, we see the same thing play out between the, the Populares leader Gaius Julius Caesar and his opponent, Pompey the Great. And while Caesar is able to defeat Pompey on the battleground, once he gets back to Rome, he's not able to kind of establish a long-term rule, in large part because of his assassination. So that, of course, happens on the Ides of March in 44 BC, somewhat ironically, in the Curia, or Senate House, of Pompey that's attached to the, the uh, Pompey's theater complex in the Campus Martius. And all the senators participate in the stabbing of Caesar. Most importantly, uh, Marcus Junius Brutus is a part of this group as well. And this is really important not just because Brutus is Caesar's good friend, which must have been quite the betrayal, but also because Marcus Junius, is Br Marcus Junius Brutus's great, 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 great grandfather was Lucius Junius Brutus. And he was the guy who kicked out Tarquin the Proud, the last king of Rome. And so once again, what we see is this kind of symbolic kicking out of a Roman tyrant. So what happens after the assassination? Well, it's a bloody mess. So one of the things is that the senators had to plan this thing very, very quickly because Caesar was about to embark upon a journey out to Parthia. And so what they're able to do is they're able to kind of get their, their stuff together for the assassination itself, but they have no plan afterwards, all right? So there's panic in the city of Rome. Antony kind of tosses off, off his, uh, his like robes, right? Um, marking him as like a, a big political figure in Rome. He wants to remain anonymous. He tosses off his robes and he flees, right? Trying to become, uh, kind of blend in with the crowds. The Senate itself um, is, is kind of, doesn't really have a plan of what to do. We see that Caesar's assassins uh, end up pardoned by the Senate, but then uh, his legislation ends up staying in place. So let's take a look at the kind of main characters here. So first of all, who is this guy Mark Antony? We've heard about him a couple different times now. And in general, he is Caesar's general in the region of Gaul. So when Caesar was going through Gaul, killing a million different uh, Gallic people, Mark Antony is his main general. And he's really good at that. 
He's also a tribune in Rome. So when the Senate was trying to get Caesar made an enemy of the state, it's Mark Antony as tribune who's vetoing that sort of thing. Now, once Mark Antony takes over, it turns out that he is a really good general and a really bad politician. He doesn't make it much on that front. So after Caesar's assassination, and after Antony is able to get away in the immediate aftermath, he takes to the people. So he goes into the Roman Forum. He has Caesar's bloody robes. He's holding them up, and he's saying, the Senate did this to your hero, right? Caesar was a hero of the people. And this causes the people to basically turn on the Senate, and those involved in the assassination, even though they're legally pardoned, have to flee. Now, one of the other main characters in this story is Caesar's adopted heir. So when the will is read, it turns out that Caesar's nephew, a guy by the name of Octavian, is adopted as his official son, right? So he becomes the heir to Caesar's fortune and perhaps his political power. Now, Octavian himself has quite the dilemma. It's not really obvious what he should do. One option is that he could run away basically flee to Caesar's legions, go to the army where he could be protected. Another option is that he could just get out of the political game altogether, basically say, I'm returning to life as a normal private citizen. And the third option is that he could make that inheritance claim, try to take Caesar's property, his money, and his power, and assert himself politically in the Roman scene. The third player in this game is the Roman Senate, of course, and they've got to figure out what to do. They end up backing Octavian as kind of the, the most prominent political ruler. And their idea is that Mark Antony poses the biggest threat because he's really well versed with Caesar's legions, right? He's got the most military experience. So they hope by backing Octavian, they can basically get Antony out of the picture. And at the first, Octavian plays along, right? He's basically very Senate-friendly at the beginning. But as he settles into a position of power, he basically flips. So Octavian takes control of the treasury, right? Takes control of the money. And then he rescinds the amnesty that he had given the assassins of Julius Caesar. So now all of a sudden, they are once again liable for this assassination. So let's take a look at the new revenge tour. So at this point in time, the Senate had believed in Octavian, that he could use him against Mark Antony. Instead, the opposite happens. Octavian actually gets together with Mark Antony, and then together with a third guy, Lepidus, he's kind of the crassus of this group, all right? Uh, they end up forming what we call the second triumvirate, all right? And unlike the first triumvirate, which was kind of a, um, uh, an unofficial group of friends, close friends, all right? This is actually a legal thing right here. So they, they bond together legally and uh, they're going to try to take control of the Roman world. And the first stop, of course, is taking care of the senators who had assassinated Julius Caesar, right? Antony's kind of leading general and Octavian's adoptive father. So we see the senators on one side and we see the second triumvirate, Octavian and Lepidus and Mark Antony on the other side. Now where this comes to a head is the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC. Now, Philippi, as you may remember, this is actually one of the cities that was founded by the father of Alexander the Great. So it's in kind of the region of Macedon in the Roman province of, uh, of Macedonia. And so we th see things kind of coming full circle to a certain extent here. And so what, again, we see on one side, we see Octavian and Mark Antony and their legions. And on the other side, we see Brutus and Cassius and the Roman senators. And the way that this ends up playing out, it plays out in kind of two different battles during a single day. And the first battle is kind of a wash, all right? So Brutus is able to actually push back Octavian's forces, while Antony is able to, able to make some progress against the forces of Cassius. Now what ends up happening is as Cassius's army is being defeated, he actually hears through the grapevine that Brutus has also been defeated. And it turns out that this isn't true, but that's what he hears. And so Cassius ends up committing suicide, thinking that the senatorial cause is lost. Now in the battle later that day, what ends up happening is Brutus is now controlling the senatorial forces, and Antony and Octavian are able to uh, kind of band together their forces uh, to attack Brutus. They're able to stretch out the line far enough uh, to the point where they could have cut off Brutus's supply line that forces Brutus to attack before he's really ready to, 
and Antony and Octavian are able to win the day. And so this essentially brings to an end the senatorial cause. So at this point in time, the leaders of the Senate have been defeated by Antony and Octavian, and all that's left is to figure out how they're going to rule the Roman world. So, two years after the assassination of Julius Caesar, the Roman Senate has kind of been put away for the time being. So let's take a look at how the Second Triumvirate decides to rule the Roman world. So, the first thing that they do is they decide that rather than ruling as a group of three from Italy and kind of ruling everything, what they're gonna do is they're gonna split up the Roman, rule, Roman world. And so at the Treaty of Brundisium in 40 BC, Octavian is awarded kind of the Western Roman world, all right, so Italy. Uh, they technically kind of all share Italy, but that's where Octavian is, is based. Uh, he also gets uh, Spain, he gets Gaul, Antony takes the Roman East, right? This is actually a really prestigious, rich area to be in with all of Macedonia, Greece, Asia, Egypt as well. And then poor little Lepidus, nobody ever really cares about Lepidus. He ends up getting North Africa, this little area down here. So they end up splitting up the Roman world and this is their way of each being able to kind of rule autonomously um, while at the same time not being in conflict with each other. Now you can imagine how this might work out, right? What's the first thing that they're going to do? Well, the first thing they're going to do is start getting into conflicts with each other, all right? And one of the ways that this happens is Antony basically makes his way down to Egypt and he falls in love with Cleopatra, right? Remember his general, Julius Caesar, had done this just a few years ago and now Antony falls in love with her, marries Cleopatra. She must have been an incredibly engaging woman. Uh, marries Cleopatra in 37 BC and this is very problematic because at the time, Antony is still married to Octavian's sister, Julia. So while he's married to her, right, while he's married to Octavian's sister, he marries someone else. And this basically says, man, civil war is imminent once again. Now, while in Rome, Octavian is basically putting up a slander can, uh, campaign against Antony. He's saying Antony just fancies himself this kind of Eastern despot, right? Like an Eastern king. He's wearing all kinds of Eastern makeup. Uh, he's ruling like a king. Whereas Octavian himself, right, is simply ruling as the rightful consul in Rome. Now, before they ever come to blows, we see Lepidus kind of foment a rebellion from his area in North Africa against Octavian in Italy in the West. And you might imagine how this turns out. Octavian ends up crushing Lepidus. And so what we see after 36 is Octavian still got the West. Antony still has Egypt in the East, ruling with Cleopatra down in Alexandria. And now Octavian, instead of Lepidus, takes North Africa. The final conflict is a naval battle at the site of Actium in 31 BCE. All right, so Actium is kind of off the coast of Greece. It's the West Coast of Northern Greece, uh, kind of Macedonia, modern day Albania, that area. And uh, what we see is we see Octavian's naval forces basically able to trap Antony and his fleet. So you see Octavian's forces on the outside here, all right? Uh, and then you see Antony's forces basically uh, towards the inside with not much room to maneuver. Now, as Octavian's forces are winning the battle, two things happen. First, Cleopatra, who for some reason is at the battle, she gets up and leaves. She goes back to Egypt. Secondly, Antony, who's supposed to be controlling his troops, he follows Cleopatra, all right? So not maybe the most bravest, most courageous Roman thing to do, but they basically see what's going to happen and they get out of Dodge. So they end up fleeing the battle, returning to Egypt, leaving the troops behind, and Antony's navy is basically uh, destroyed there. And this gives Octavian more or less sole control of the Roman world. But it doesn't get Antony and Cleopatra off the hook. So Mark Antony at this point, right, with his army destroyed, he knows kind of where the winds are blowing. And so as he gets back to Egypt, he ends up falling on his own sword, taking away the last kind of major competitor to Octavian. In Cleopatra, she also kind of knows which way the winds are blowing. And rather than fall on a sword, she takes the Egyptian asp, right, this kind of venomous cobra, and takes the poison, lets the asp bite her, and takes that poison, uh, and therefore uh, commits suicide herself. And so at this point in time, 
Now we have Octavian ruling in the west, we've got Octavian ruling in the east, and we've got Octavian ruling in North Africa. And it's Octavian who basically rules the entire Roman world. So let's wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So first of all, if you're going to assassinate the most powerful person in Rome, have a plan, right? Have a plan for what to do afterwards. Don't let the streets run red with blood and then just kind of hope that his son is somehow going to fix things. Second, uh, we have this kind of struggle between uh, the second triumvirate, Octavian and Lepidus and Anthony, and uh, the Roman Senate. And so the Senate believed Octavian would go to their side. He does not. And, and this second triumvirate is able to defeat the Roman Senate in battle at Philippi in 42 BC. And then finally, right, the kind of maybe final takeaway from this is that it's very difficult to share power. And so we see them split things up with the goal that everybody can kind of rule independently, and nobody's really happy with the territory that they have. They always want to expand. And so now we're left with this question, right? What happens next? Octavian's got control of everything. The Senate has been put in its place. Antony is dead. Lepidus is dead. Octavian rules the entire known Roman world. And so how is he going to organize this in a way that can put an end to the civil wars that have go been going on for almost a century? But we'll take a look at that next time after we conclude the Battle for Rome.